Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick. And today's guest is actually someone who I've had on before. And this is my first time having someone on twice. And I'm super excited to have Kimberly Ann Johnson on again. And she's a sexological body worker, somatic experiencing practitioner, yoga teacher, postpartum advocate and single mom. She works hands on in integrative women's health and trauma recovery for more than a decade. She's been helping women heal from birth injuries, gynecological issues and sexual boundary violations. And Kimberly is the author of Call of the Wild, How We Heal Trauma, Awaken Our Own Power and Use It for Good, as well as the early mothering classic, The Fourth Trimester. And she's the host of the Sex, Birth, and Trauma podcast. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me on twice. I'm so excited. I I always was like, oh, yeah, but I've had that person on. Oh, I've had that person on. But then when um, we reconnected, I was like, oh, I'm so excited. We need to like catch up. And, and also, you have a new book out. And I'm so excited to learn more about it. I've been like reading stuff here and there in it just like during you know all my other I feel like I always have like five books I'm reading at once you know well plus you know the first time we talked you didn't have any children and we were talking about the fourth trimester and now you have Uh, two two. (laughs) yeah (laughs) one and three quarters and now we're talking about this other book so it's wild well like okay so the first time we talked I was I was like learning really so much about the importance of focusing on the fourth trimester, right? Because at the time I knew I wanted to have a kid. I didn't know I wanted to have a son, actually. I, um, <laughs> But I am so happy I did. So yeah, I was really excited to have kids, but I, you know, I wasn't there yet. I wasn't even pregnant, but I learned so much from you and just like started doing my research really in the importance of like taking care of the mom and how different cultures, like you mentioned in your um, fourth trimester book, like how they heal or, um, and take care of the mother and how some people, some women go into go back and live with their moms and the mom takes care of them. Like it's really stuck with me and I loved it so much. And, and so when I went on to have my son, I decided, okay, I will have a hostile birth. I was like kind of playing around with a home birth, but then I, I didn't trust myself enough at that time. Uh, Not that, you know, it's everyone's personal decision, but for me, I think it really came down to trust. And I, I was okay with like my birth experience. Like the hospital was great about, you know, letting me opt out of things and skin to skin contact and all that. But I really, I learned so much about myself as you do when you give birth. And since then, like now that I'm pregnant with my daughter, I had to like really go back to healing the trauma of my first birth. And a lot of it had to do with like the postpartum period, actually, because a series of events happened. And I've talked about that a lot, but really, I never focused on the trauma from like my actual birth. And it's funny, you mentioned that I was telling you, like, thank God I had that epidural. But um, because I kept I went into it, like, I'm going to do a natural birth at a hospital. And I'm going to be the one that can do it because I'm so informed. I'm going to say no to everything. There's no way they're going to get to me, blah, blah, blah. But what happened was like my water broke at noon and like my contractions didn't start. And so my doctor who was on board with natural, he was like, well, if it doesn't start, like meet me at the hospital. But he had been the one telling me labor at home for as long as possible before you come. But then I started my laboring journey essentially at the hospital. So I was there forever. So then I like after 36 hours, I decided to get that epidural, but I like kept telling myself, oh, whatever. Like I was you know, I was weak at that point. I needed it. But really, like what happened was they induced me with cytotech. I couldn't even say the word cytotech until I started working with my um, craniosacral therapist. And that's like part of, I think that's a really important part of our conversation today, you and I. There's like a couple things that are in here that I think like you'll definitely like speak to. But like, 
I didn't realize, I kept telling myself, oh, I had a great birth at that hospital. Like that, that was the story I kept telling myself. But then I realized when someone asked me about it, that I couldn't even say the word cytotech because I didn't know what it was. My doula didn't know what it was. So I felt like, oh, I came to this hospital. I have all this knowledge, but that's the one thing when they offered it to me, even though, yeah, it's a pill, but they were like, this is a natural way to induce you without Pitocin. That's like how they worded it. And then I find out that it's like an abortion pill. And I like was stuck on this idea of like taking an abortion pill and feeling like, oh, then my child's going to feel like I don't want them in there, you know? So I was like the first step. And then I ended up with that epidural, but really the reason, and so wild I was watching your live or something you had posted, um, from your book, book launch. Cause I couldn't make it to your book launch. So then I went and like watched it. I think you had it online. Yeah. So then I went on your Instagram and was watching it that night and you were recounting like the trauma from you know, how animals like shake things off. And I'd known that actually, and I don't know if it's because you and I talked about that probably years ago, but that's exactly what my experience was before the epidural. I know sometimes like the epidural gives people the shakes, but really I, when I was like watching you do that, and I was thinking about how after my birth, I've noticed that the way I process so much pain is by shaking. I get really cold and uncomfortable and that my body shakes. But at the time when I was like literally sitting or laying on the bed, like I was shaking so much, Kimberly, that it was like, I was, it was like, I was having an exorcism. I was literally like jumping. My body was jumping off the bed. And that's when I decided to get the epidural, I think, because I couldn't handle what seeing myself do that. And I, or, and I couldn't handle my partner seeing me doing that. Like I felt like I was, you know, taken over by another entity. And I, and it's so interesting because now my whole view on it has shifted so much and I've worked through all that trauma. And I just feel like if that were to happen to me again, if that is how I'm going to process the pain this time around, yeah, I have like tools to like get in the bathtub or do other things. But I think really it's pers- it also is perspective of like, wow, my body is like naturally doing this because that's how it's processing this. And that's how we primally process that. And, and it's just so much to me, the perspective of it being beautiful rather than, Oh my God, what's happening to me. I have no control over myself is such an important thing to have and awareness to have. And so anyways, when I was watching you kind of reenact that, it reminded me of my birth. (laughs) I was like, Oh my gosh, this is exactly what I need to see to remind myself that that is beautiful. And that's nature. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot there. Um, the shaking, it can be a lot of different things. I think these days people are really into like TRE, like trauma release exercises where you intentionally shake. And that can be one way that you discharge stored tension and energy, right? So what you're referring to for the listeners is like the full nervous system cascade of having a, a large amount of activation, which being in labor is definitely a large amount of activation. That's one of the reasons that we need to prepare for it in ways that are not intellectual because we're going to experience things that that are out of our control. And there's not that many places in our life, especially as people who live in a culture that's pretty well-organized and predictable, uh, that we lose control. Um, it sounds like you were having this, those shakes after you got cytotech. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So your body was responding to the cytotech. Yeah. Not just your body on its own is doing that. Mm-hmm. And cytotech is its own whole story. It's not just an abortion drug. It's it's actually been through clinical trials for abdominal pain, and it doesn't actually have clinical trials as a labor induction drug. And I'd had to do like two rounds because the first round didn't even work. Yeah. And so, and you already know, you know, with somebody who's living, who's like clean living, um, that we don't know exactly how we're going to respond to different things because 
we're not, our system's not used to dealing with those kinds of chemicals. And, you know, if you were at home and you were trying to induce, um, you, there's a number of things that you might do, right? You might drink castor oil and, and people who are listening should not take my medical advice because I'm not a doctor, but you know, for thousands of years, midwives have tools of how you would induce. You could drink castor oil. You could take some different kinds of homeopathic remedies. You could give yourself an enema. You know, there's like a bunch of different things that you could do, but in the hospital, the tools are fairly, um, narrow in terms of how to do the induction. And then as you said, there's your inner experience of, but when you, when you have another substance in your system, you're not going to be able to judge as well. What's, what is a natural reaction and what is not a natural reaction, right? Like, is this something that's good for you or is this something that's harming you more? And plus you're in labor. So you're also thinking about your baby, like, okay, you don't want to see yourself that way. And you don't want your partner to see yourself that way, but is that good for your baby? And you don't really know, right? You're kind of going and like, and you don't know how long it's going to last and you don't know all these different kinds of things. So, you know, unfortunately these days in labor, labor is a combination of all of the tiers of our nervous system. So we have the social nervous system, we have the sympathetic nervous system, and we have the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, when we feel safe, in our social nervous system, we feel like we belong. We feel like we could say what we need to, and we're not going to lose connection with the person. There won't be conflict. They won't give us worse treatment. For instance, we feel like, okay, this is, this is an environment where I can really be myself. And then under safety in the sympathetic system, that's where you would be having the surges. That's where you would be feeling the, the onset of the wave of a contraction. And then in the parasympathetic, that's where you have dilation. So that's like the letdown. That's coming down the back of the wave where your cervix can dilate and open. And you're going through those cycles and you're cascading through them, through the entire the entire birth. The actual like fetal ejection reflex is a sympathetic action, but you need to feel safe. And feeling safe is it's not your mind necessarily feeling safe. It's your body feeling safe. And before we're actually in the situation, we're not always the best judges of that. So we think, well, in my whole life, the hospital has been the safe place, or I've been told I should trust the hospital. And so, and my, most women think, well, my partner feels safer at the hospital and I need my partner's support. So I don't want my partner to feel uncomfortable because then I'm going to feel like I'm taking care of my partner too. Mm -hmm. So let me just go in this middle ground maybe where I can try for a natural birth in the hospital and see how it goes. But then in a way, the more we know in our mind, the worse it gets because then the minute you get, everyone's heard of the cascade of interventions. So you start to worry because you go, oh, I had one. Does that mean I'm on that slippery slope? And should I just continue on that? Or can I interrupt it? So when we feel under threat in the social nervous system, we feel like we can't, we don't know what we really want outside of what the norm of the place is. And then in the sympathetic, we have the fight or flight response. And then in the parasympathetic, we have the freeze or the collapse. So a lot of people who have the quote unquote failure to progress, they're actually in a parasympathetic freeze. You can't dilate, nothing can happen because your system is so threatened. Now your brain might not be, your brain might be going, well, this is what I wanted and I chose this, but your body is saying, this is not a safe place for me to open. And that could be because it's cold. That could be because of the lighting. That could be because of someone's energy who walked in the room that you're like, oh, I hope I don't get that nurse or I hope they change shifts. Mm -hmm. Uh, It could be because you got a completely different care provider and you're like, oh boy, I've never even met this person before. It could be a look on someone's face who walks in. And so it's, somebody asked me this question the other day, which I really loved is like, how did being a doula inform this book, Call of the Wild? And it's like, to me, it's kind of everything because when you're in birth, you're just in the exaggeration of a big experience. Birth doesn't have to be traumatic, but it is a, it is a stressful event, even if it's fantastic. Yeah. There's a big stress. But what turns stress into trauma is a lack of mobilization. So whatever parts of us are immobilized, the things we can't say, the movements we can't make that get stuck inside, that's what is held onto as trauma. So the amazing thing is in the fourth trimester, 
that's why all these cultures have the fourth trimester, because you can metabolize any traumatic birth if you have the right things. Because really, the fourth trimester necessities, extended rest, warm foods, nutrient-dense foods, um, touch, loving touch, presence of wise women, those are that's like trauma 911, basically. It's like what you need immediately to calm your system. And so when you have that over time in a lot of the, you know, Mexican traditions of closing the bones, there's a cathartic element to it. You get wrapped up, but you also, you might get swatted with herbs. You would be taking really hot shower to flush out all the hormones that are maybe still coursing and haven't made their way all the way out because we know, okay, this is stressful. We don't want to store this. We want to restore our energy. So we need a way to, to move through it. So we're asking a lot of women and I, and it's sort of like a, I don't know what you would call it, but I, it's either like you could call it a cultural crossroads or you could call it like a catch 22 that our idea of ferocity, like what you said, I'm strong. I know my boundaries. I can say no to all these things. That's a sympathetic orientation. Like I'm going to defend myself and you can back up and like, I'm going to be able to do this that's actually shouldn't be our job when we're giving birth because yeah. that sympathetic orientation doesn't allow ourselves to relax, let go and do what we need for birthing. And mm-hmm. so we're putting this physiology in like one of those finger traps where you can't pull your fingers out because at the same time we're telling women, well, yeah, you're going to have to do this because the birth system is this way and that way. And, but really we have to change the context or have people around us that we really believe can protect the space because we shouldn't have to be protecting our space. It's like you can't pace the perimeter and be the person giving birth at the same time. When we talk about tackling climate change, we tend to focus on transportation, food, and energy. But as I've said before, what we wear is just as important. And it all starts with the fibers. 65% of clothes are made from plastics derived from fossil fuels, and 80% end up in landfills or incinerators. It takes nearly 350 million barrels of oil a year to meet demand for plastic-based fibers, and when those clothes are washed or discarded, the damage is even worse. Polyester, nylon, and acrylic clothes are responsible for between a quarter and a third of all microplastics in the ocean. Fortunately, there's a solution, and it's natural fibers. If we reduce our dependence on plastic fibers, we can meaningfully lower the industry's carbon footprint. So today, I'd like to talk a little bit about Alex Crane, a brand that makes beautiful clothes exclusively from natural fibers. Most of Alex Crane's clothes are made of linen, an incredible natural material made from flax. Flax grows without irrigation or fertilizer. It needs only sun and rain. Flax actually improves the land. One hectare absorbs almost four tons of CO2 per year and adds nutrients back into the soil. And once woven into fabric, Linen has amazing natural properties. It's heat regulating, antimicrobial, it doesn't hold odor, and it dries super fast. All perfect qualities for these hot summer days. For all its benefits, linen accounts for only 1% of global apparel production. And Alex Crane is out here to change that. They offer shorts, shirts, tees, pants, and jackets all made from the highest quality French flax dyed in perfect colors, and washed in a special blend of biodegradable softeners. The result is supremely soft and breezy clothes with perfect body and drape. So if you're looking for summer-ready, breezy clothes and also want to push the apparel industry in the right direction, shop Alex Crane and use code THEFULLEST at checkout, all one word uppercase, for 15% off your order. I love that. And that was definitely my experience was, um, my husband, I mean, it was our first, so he wasn't comfortable having a birth at home and like, we kind of entertained it. And then we felt like we had found a doctor that was pretty great and was going to respect everything. But again, it was like, I had my defenses up right from the beginning. And 
And that's the tough part because it goes back to trust. Like if you'd have, if you can't, like you said, I could just couldn't let go. But yeah, I think, yeah, I love the fourth trimester. And as soon as you came out with this book, it made so much sense to me. So that's great that someone had that question for you. But I love what you said about trauma and stress and how you can have a stressful event that doesn't lead to trauma. And I think that is something to really like marinate on for a while. I can just sit and think about that for so long because also the experience, like other people's experiences, if you're an empath or whatever, seep in and you kind of think about that too, in that context of what is traumatic for one person or what is a stressful event for one person that doesn't lead to trauma can be a traumatic event for another person. Definitely. And you can't evaluate it from the outside. So for sure, there were people in your birth that were going to say, I mean, sometimes it's incontrovertible, like, whoa, that was intense. And like, you know, but what's also really important to understand is in birth, we're really in survival mode. It is a life or death. We're at the life death gate. It is, you know, it's a life threatening event. It's also totally natural events, but you know, there it's, the stakes are really high. Our sur- we're in our survival brain. So afterwards, when we do survive, most women, and this I learned this from Pam England, who wrote Birthing from Within, it's almost universal that after giving birth, you are so grateful. You're grateful to everyone who was there. You're grateful to the hospital, even if it <laughs> was shitty, yeah. because you're just like, I made it. And yeah. like, thank you to everyone. Like, and And so it's just this, that's what would happen after a near death experience. That's what you're going to have. First of all, is just like, I'm so glad I survived and my baby survived. Right. And that's where this cultural thing about like, well, you know, you survive and you have a happy baby. And then that's where it ends when actually yeah. that's just, that's a part of how our physiology, because when you're in a deep freeze. So when I help people renegotiate a deep freeze, which could be anything, it could have been a car accident they were in. It could have been a dynamic with a parent that was really overbearing. So they could never, they could never respond. It was always just coming at them one way. And so they just learned how to just be frozen. Um, It could be a sexual assault. It could be an abortion. It could be a number of things. When I help people come out of that freeze and I don't use any words, I'm just helping them through sound, through being close to them, through maintaining contact, like just so you know, I'm still here. What they say is I exist. Because the return from feeling like you're either dissociated and completely separate from yourself or that you're just alive. Like that's why I end chapter five with I'm here and I'm alive because that's what you say right away. But then eventually we need to cycle up into like I am, I matter and what I want is important and I can trust myself, right? Um. But that very first instinct is just oh my gosh, I made it. And then we get confused because we go, well, I was so like, and other people might say, well, you said you had a really good experience. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean? Like, why are you, why are you doubling back now? Like you can't, you were happy when you came out of the hospital. And it's like, well, yes, because that's a phase of the survival patterning before you come back to your own agency. And like, well, actually I was kind of coerced. And Actually, I was in a completely unfamiliar situation that I never anticipated with people who had zero information. And that's actually kind of not okay. You know? Wow. And so can you, so it sounds like you can be in that freeze until you process it with like a specific thing. Yeah. And that's why so many people will say, you know, they'll come to me and say, I just don't know what's going on. Like, I just don't feel sexual since I've had a baby or what's wrong with my vagina? I had a C-section and still my vagina is just hurting or tight. Or in our culture, all we know how to say is like, I have low libido. But really what's happening is their pelvis is in a freeze and they are, it's basically like nothing's going to pass this place until this other thing is resolved. Mm -hmm. And whatever was, whatever kind of belief, idea, dynamic relationship dynamic was put in place at that time because for a lot of people it's like they didn't feel protected um they they didn't feel safe and 
even if rationally you're like, well, my partner did the best they could, you still, your physicality might still feel like, well, why didn't they defend me? Or why didn't they, why didn't they give me the orientation or my birth team or whomever? So that freeziness will stay and it will impact other parts of our lives. And it will be confusing because it won't fit the idea that we think we should have, like, or that we want to have. And that's really, that's sort of the hallmark of all of the work is we want to feel some way, which is usually good, right? We want to feel good. We want to feel quote unquote over it. We don't want to hang on to things. Uh, We want to feel emotionally available, all those things. But something in our system, in our physiology is, is like saying a no, saying like, this isn't, I don't feel like myself. I don't feel right. I don't, and I don't know. So how much of it is, because it, to me, I think someone can, like you said, intellectualize something forever with their therapist, but never feel it. So how much of the work that you mentioned in Call of the Wild and and the trauma work like is physical? How much of it is intellectual? Like how do you um, work with people? So somatic is kind of like physical, although everything physical is not necessarily somatic. And talking can also be somatic Mm -hmm. because the content of what we say carries the state of our physiology. So like emotions, if someone's saying that they're frustrated and irritated over and over again, that's a low level fight response that hasn't been completed. Or if someone's saying, I'm so worried, I'm, or some people say like, I'm terrified. That's like a high level flight response that hasn't been completed. And that's like anxiety is a lot of incomplete flight responses. Mm -hmm. Or if someone's confused, disoriented, or just apathetic, listless, resigned, that's, those are parasympathetic, incomplete freeze responses. When I'm working with someone, the whole time I'm tracking what their physiology is telling me, things like their heart rate, pupil dilation, how fast or slow they're talking, how their orientation is in their spine, um, it, movements that someone will make that they won't notice they're making. And I'm, I noticed I made one while we were talking. So a common one is that people will put their hands out in front of them, like they're pushing something away, especially that comes up a lot in birth. And also people will come and they'll, and they'll show the level of their diaphragm. And a lot of times that's when they've had an epidural where they can't wow. take their awareness below the place where the epidural went in. And then when that happens, like if I'm helping someone do like a body scan, I'm always, I always kind of know, okay, we're in epidural territory because any kind of anesthesia is a forced freeze response. Yeah. So if you've had earlier freeze responses, then you're probably going to have a stronger response to an epidural. So for some people, they get an epidural and it's like the best thing ever and they don't have residue and it takes off just the right amount of pain. And some people even have a quote unquote walking epidural so they could actually still move a little bit. But if you you don't really know how you're going to respond to it. And someone like me, I'm already parasympathetic dominant. I have elastinous connective tissue and I'm a redhead and redheads are notoriously either hypersensitive to anesthesia or under sensitive. So we have to get twice as much or just a little and we overreact. And everyone knows this midwives knows it, hospitals know it. So if you had earlier freeze, because a lot of women say to me, well, why didn't I just tell my doctor this? And it's like, well, because you already had an epidural. So you're already in a low level free state or high level. And so you're going to have less access to that self advocacy once you're already because your body is receiving it as a freeze. If your body would normally want to move, it knows it can't. It knows it can't fight or flee because it's numb. So that's what it's doing to your physiology. Yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, you're the one, they put fentanyl in epidurals. Like it's insane what's in there. And anyways, but yeah, so it definitely freezes you. (laughs) Well, and you know, now 35% of people have cesareans in the US. And so of course you need an epidural for a cesarean. You need wow. You of course you have to have anesthesia to have abdominal surgery. Um the point is not the thing itself, it's what it does to our physiology and then like I've seen people come out of cesarean deliveries and shake, which you should because your body is flushing out the epidural and then 
people trying to help you stop shaking when you absolutely should continue shaking until all of that just works its way out of your system. It's freaky, but it's actually your body cycling through whatever is left over in that process. Mm -hmm. So um, I have definitely seen epidurals work and work well and not have trauma afterwards. And it's just like, I just want people to know if that was the case for you or, or you had surgery, like some people are going to go through a surgery and they're going to feel and recover relatively well. I mean, it's, we should also mention that there's like no other surgery really besides other female surgeries where you get no PT afterwards. Like you just get a surgery and then that's it. Like that's insane. Um, hysterectomies, no, no, no physical therapy. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. And I've worked with a lot of both of those scenarios. But what happens is women, we blame ourselves. We think, why am I not recovering faster? You know, they tell you after a hysterectomy, the same thing as a C-section, six weeks, and then you're good to go with sex and exercise. And it's like, I've never met a person after six weeks of a hysterectomy who was even remotely prepared for either of those things. Yeah. And so what I want my work to do is take off the layer of shame and self-loathing that gets built up on top of just what's happening in the physiology. So it's no, it's not your fault if you're not getting over it, or it's not your fault. And I mean, it's not really anyone's fault, really. It's just, this is how physiology works. So once you have that information, then you need to attend to those lower level responses. And, you know, do you need a practitioner it's helpful. It kind of depends on how, how you work. Um, I mean, I think anyone postpartum needs other humans around them. So just that in and of itself is important. Like you, everything a new baby needs, a new mom needs. So you would never leave a new baby alone for more than an hour at a time. You would never leave a baby without a food source. You would never let a baby get cold and just have its limbs out all over the place. Right. So the mom needs the same thing, but um, in my work, it's mostly done through timing and touch and, and not always touch because these days I'm working a lot online and doing teaching classes because I do feel like the education is a huge part of it. Just knowing what's happening because as I'm talking and as you're talking, I'm sure the listeners are having a lot of aha moments and the ahas aren't just happening in your brain. They're happening in your body. It's like, oh, Maybe people are having an emotional response or maybe they're feeling sensations. And so I really help people get fluent with the language of the body, which once you have that fluency, you can really communicate with, you know, the parts of yourself can communicate with each other. So there's more coherence between what your brain is interpreting and what your body is actually experiencing. Oh my gosh, it's, it's, like you said, the education and us talking about it, it's really all comes back to just having that awareness and then like tapping in to it. But there's just so many layers too. I mean, there was like this quote the other day that I saw somewhere and it was, it was like, I mean, actually maybe we posted it. I don't know mm -hmm. what it was <laughs> or we're about to, but it was like, when you cry from something you thought you healed from, like, it's okay to cry from something that you thought you healed from because you're like going back to it. But I think <laughs> I hope that's okay. I mean, isn't I that know. just like being human? Like, I know, but I think, well, yeah, but at the same time, like our society, our culture, it's like also so type a, so, okay. Right. Where you're so like, like, you're supposed to like do the healing, like a checklist and you're like, okay, I dealt with that experience. Check. That'll never um, come back. Um, I was with Kimberly Johnson. I had like, <laughs> 20, I don't know, this many sessions and now I'm done, you know, whatever. But I think just going back, being okay with being okay with feeling. I love um, also just thinking about like to feel is to heal, you know, and having that perspective of how amazing it is that we're able to be, uh, to experience these things and then to go back to them and to process them later on. After I feel like what you're saying is is really pointing to, and I hate using these words sometimes because I think that they're so they're overused and then they don't mean anything. But it's like it's basically patriarchy because the fact that we would even have to say it's okay yeah. to feel is like we live in a culture that only thinks that the brain, the intellect, and the rational are important. 
and that anything else is weak and something to overcome and not just human. I mean, if we lived in a culture that valued women, valued birth, valued nonlinear experience, valued the earth, then it would just be obvious. Like we're not robots. We're human animals. Yeah. The fact that we even have to say it out loud is crazy. I mean, it, it's like trusting your intuition, right? Cause it can be so irrational to other people. What I mean, I, I talked, I've talked about this a lot lately. I, ever since becoming a mom, I'm like, nope, no, I'm not doing that. Or, oh, I have a two week trip planned to Texas. Yeah. I'm not getting on the plane tomorrow morning. Cause it just doesn't feel right. And I'm going to be okay with that decision. And I have four other people going that have planned this trip and that's okay. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not taking my son there, you know, but it's like just making that decision to other people. It's like, that's selfish, you know, but when you feel, when you start to really trust yourself and do this, this type of work that you help people do, I think it's just a life changing. And it brings me to tears sometimes when people can have, just knowing that people can have that relationship with themselves. Like you said, it's like the advocacy, but it's also just energetically, yeah, having a connection with that part of ourselves because as a society and because of patriarchy, we don't value that at all. And it's, that's what the, to me, the medical system represents or the hospitals. Yeah. I mean, if you're really going to follow your instincts and you're going to listen to your intuition and you're going to heed the call of the wild, things are not going to always make sense. Mm -hmm. They might not make sense to other people, but they also might not make sense to you. And maybe farther down your path, you'll look back and you'll know if it made sense or not. But at the time, you don't. And it is going against the grain. And there's so many different examples of that. And, and ultimately, there's a lot of people that are probably do have your best interests at heart and are and really care about you and all those things. But only you can listen to that voice and follow it because no one else can do it for you. So only you can decide, this is my bottom line, or this is, and I think what people don't understand, because I teach a course called limits and boundaries. And I think for people who are empathic and people who are really sensitive and people who might have had trouble with boundaries, maybe they had like a codependent relationship with a parent or come from an alcoholic family. Like I do something like that. The, the vision of boundaries is being mean. It's like they, the, to say what you want feels like it's confrontive. And some people actually do it that way when they're practicing, like it's, it's harsh. It's like, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Um, but when you're following your intuition, it's actually just incontrovertible. It's just like, this isn't right for me. And nobody can really argue with that. You know, it's just like, this isn't right for me. This, this isn't feeling right. Um, it's time for me to bow out here. I thought this is what I wanted and now I'm here and it's not what I want anymore. I feel good about where we've come to this point and now I feel complete and I'd like to move on or I'd like to have some space or I, I need a pause right? There's just so many ways that we, I I had a conversation with a close friend of mine named Dan Doty, who um, used to work for an organization called Every Man. And he kind of does work with men. That's like what I do with women. And he came into my course and we had like a very fun, deep conversation. And then a lot of the women reflected back to me that they thought I was being mean to him. And I was like, weird. And then I was like, was I being mean? Like, what would I do? What'd I say? So I asked Dan, I was like, did you feel like I was like edgy or like rude to you during? He's like, no, not at all. And then I realized, oh, this is actually people's response when women are not fawning. When I'm just being myself in my full power and I'm just showing up as, as myself and I'm not trying to make him like me or I'm not trying to like, th- people interpret that as mean. And so you know, that's why there's a jaguar on the cover of the book. Because when you're hunting, it's not a negative or positive experience. It's not good or bad. That's, that's a moral, that's an ideology. It's a phys, it's physiological. And so we get in trouble when we're putting moral values on these things. But actually, protecting your own soul and protecting your inner voice 
that's our like divine directive. Like that's our, that's, that's like kind of the singular job we have in incarnation. And, you know, then it gets harder with motherhood because then we've got parallel tracks we're running of, you know, tracking that for ourselves and tracking that for our child, our children. But yeah, we really need to start understanding the difference between centered and grounded intuition and this other thing that's sort of like hyper reactive or overcompensating. That's such a good point. And it's so important because we're from the moment we're born. I I mean, we're, you know, taking care of, but then we're also being taught to not trust ourselves, not on purpose, but it just comes out in subtle ways. And so my son has a um, rare genetic condition and it's called MCAT. And that's part of like my postpartum, postpartum, like trauma, traumatic experience was, um, when he was four days old, they called my pediatrician, said I needed to go to the state hospital. I needed to stay the night. And, um, I disagreed with the hospital with how they were like treating him and how the, their, what their protocol was essentially. And so they called child protective services and the sheriff on us and they were going to take him away. Oh and my gosh. It was so insane. Um, but the reason I'm bringing that up, what, and I had a reason for bringing that up, but anyways, that was like a super traumatic experience. Well, maybe but, just take a moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, oh, okay. So this is why I was telling you also, um, I ended up having to work with that, that doctor as my son's specialist, the doctor that called CPS on us, um, for about a year after. And every I, because we had an open, we had an, it wasn't technically an open case, but they didn't like believe that I was like going to take care of my son's condition essentially. I mean, they had to come to our house. They had to make sure we had a crib or else they wouldn't release him. Even though it's not illegal to not have a crib, I co-slept with my son, but luckily I did have a crib. I was you know, I was so bitchy back. I was like, I have three cribs. Do you want one? Just get me out of here. But anyways, his condition, he just, what it is, is he can't go into ketosis. So it's very manageable. Um, as long as he eats every, you know, however many hours, it's fine. It's scary when they're sick. And also as toddlers, like sometimes they just refuse to eat and they're just running around and that's really scary too. Um, so It's interesting because with my background and like really caring about alternative health and eating well and going to culinary school for plant-based food and, and and knowing, um, you know, just the relationship that we have as a culture with food and, and not wanting to recreate that with him. It was so difficult for me because on one hand I wanted him to, and I still, I want him to trust his intuition when it comes to if he's not hungry, it's fine. Like that was kind of my whole thing is we don't need to force them to eat. But then on the other hand, I'm like, well, you need to be alive and I need to make sure that you like stuff this thing in your mouth, you know? Mm -hmm. But I was, I was thinking about, I've been thinking about that for years because I was reading something and it said, if we offer something to them, and I think this is just true for all of us, right? If you I say, Hey, do you want to eat some watermelon? And he says, no, I'm not hungry. And then I want to force him. So you like, keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. Then I've read that that is a way to kind of, um, subtly like teach them to not trust their intuition. Right. I I taught, but luckily I moved on from that specialist. I have Zach Bush as our specialist, who's amazing. And he's taught me so much about this condition. And I've talked to him about that because what I've noticed is my anxiety was also obviously on it because I was afraid as anyone would be like managing a condition like this. But I've noticed like, even with sleeping, like he's not supposed to go um, longer than now that he's older, he can go 12 hours from the last time he ate. But sometimes it's literally like been 12 hours and five minutes. And I'm like, do I wake him up? Do I not? What do I do? What's he going to be like when he wakes up? I think about that all the time. And lately, um, ever since like working with Zach, I'm like, okay, 
he'll wake up if he's hungry. Like, I mean, obviously if it's like a really long period of time, I would never do that, but just kind of playing around with it. And nine times out of 10, he like, ever since I started like practicing this and practicing that his body knows what it needs, I, every single time, like now that I don't force it, he does come and say he's hungry. Or now that I, I don't go in there freaking out, trying to wake him up before the 12 hours. Cause I think at 12 hours, all of a sudden he's going to die. You know, like he just wakes up and he's like, Hey mom, okay, let's go downstairs. I'm, you know, and he like eats something. But I think the reason I share that is because it's such an intense situation of on one hand, like needing to medically like manage something. So it is a really serious thing rather than like a lot of parents are like, Oh, my kid doesn't eat. And I'm like, you know, but, and then also trying to raise someone to um, be confident in themselves, trust their intuition from the beginning and know that they, they know exactly what they need. And so I don't know, I think it's interesting to be a parent, like after all this, after the birth, after all this, then knowing this information, knowing the work and the research that you've done, how do you, how do you instill that in your kids so that they don't necessarily, it's just part of their life is evaluating these experiences and trying essentially to take it. Like you said, you said, sometimes it could just be a stressful experience and not turn into trauma because we have the tools. So how I think that's like the ultimate thing, right? As a parent and as, and for yourself is to try and figure out that sweet spot of understanding it when it's happening, you know, and trying to process it. Yeah. So anyways, I'm kind of going on, but I think it'd be interesting to talk about that. Well, one thing that I, a couple of things, one of them is we call things associative stacks, which are iterative experiences in our nervous system that remind us of other things. So when you were, we were talking about earlier, like, oh, there I am crying about this thing. It's the infamous, you know, we have one breakup and then it reminds us of all the other breakups or it's our birthday. And then we're remind, we're reminded of the other birthdays, right? So that's just how things are stored in our nervous system. And these things, you know, we come in the world with our original blueprints It's like our record, our LP. And then we have these imprints that happen as we go through life. And um, they're like scratches on a record. And the record just keeps skipping at that same point, whether that's like the birthday or it could be an intersection or it could be a doctor's face. You know, it could be all kinds of things. And those imprints make us who we are. Um, You know, your family are immigrants, recent immigrants. It's like, you wouldn't want to erase that even if it was traumatic because that's part of who you are. It's part of your heritage. Um, my family, you know, all the men are alcoholics. It's like, I would like to not perpetuate that or continue on with it, but that in and of itself gives me a lot of information about my own nervous system and about going forward. When you're in early postpartum and you're already recovering, um, and, and I think that's why some people feel like an urgency, like, oh, I've got to deal with the birth. But it's like there was it was going to take you a lot of time to deal with that because you were just dealing with stress upon stress right away. So there really wasn't time for you to deal with yourself and what happened. It's like that kind of had to be encapsulated while you got through the other layers until there was a space that it was safe enough, that your child was safe enough, that your family was safe enough for you to return back to that experience. and. You know, it seems like an extreme experience, but it's not so rare. You know, it's not so rare that a child has a condition or that even something that to me seems like it should be so rare, like child protective services. I've heard lots of those stories. So, of course, that's going to keep us in this survival space where we couldn't really reevaluate what came before it. Um, But the other thing I heard you say was the interconnection between your nervous system and your child's nervous system. And that's called co-regulation. It's part of our social nervous system and it was designed for the survival of our young. It sometimes is a way that women blame themselves. Like, well, if I could just be more calm, then maybe my kid would chill out. But if we can have a soft touch and we can be very compassionate about it with ourselves, we can start to find the tools and realize like what is an accurate reaction to the situation 
And then what is all of the stress or trauma that's underneath it that's bumping it so that any small little thing is pushing me over the threshold into this extreme reaction that then my child is also having a response to. I do imagine there's conditions where something that feels completely antithetical to a child is actually what they need. You know, like um, if someone had cancer, like no one's going to opt for whatever treatment, but like you have to as a parent help them understand and get through something that they ultimately don't want. But I know for me, like I remember my daughter had two cavities when she was two um, because of I used to just nurse co-sleeping and I'm a single mom and I, she just basically have her breast in my, like I, she'd just be nursing all night long pretty much. So she got um, cavities in her two-year-old molars. And I thought that I needed, like I just was really upset about it and I felt like it just needed they needed to be treated. And I was in Brazil and I was also a little unsure. And I think, I think American dentistry is kind of like the best and that's my prejudice. And so I was sort of doubtful about the Brazilian dentists and like, do they really know what they're doing? And it was really expensive for me at the time, but long story short, like I felt like I needed to hold her down to get it done until there came to a point where I was like, what am I doing? Like, this isn't that like, what's the worst that's going to happen? Like, so she has teeth that have still have cavities in them. Like the damage I'm doing with this huge fight that I'm going through with is like creating so much stress for me and so much stress for her. Like this just, it can, this just can't be the right way. But before that I was doing it because I thought I was doing the right thing, you know? And I, I remember too, when I was figuring out nursing, I, I had a very stressful postpartum recovery um, in a lot of different ways. And I had a low milk supply. And I don't know if that's because of all the stress or if I just actually do have a low milk supply. And if I lived in a tribe, somebody else with a large milk supply would be feeding my kid. Like, I don't really know. I'm assuming that it was because I was really stressed. But they kept telling me at the milk bank to have her sitting up like at six weeks old to like sit her on my leg and then hold her head and then squeeze my boob and then thrust my boob to her head and her, and her head to my boob at the same time. And it felt so aggressive. And a friend of mine came to visit and, and like she was watching it. And it was just kind of like, I'm just going through these motions because someone told me to do this. And because I'm desperate, because I don't have anyone here that I can ask to nurse my child. I don't want to give her formula. Like to me, formula was like the worst thing I could possibly do. I couldn't find any formula that didn't have hydrogenated oils and just everything that I was like against. But at the same time, she was really hungry, I could tell. And so, you know, we just find ourselves as mothers in the, and people in these. It's, it's not like this is all just easy and straightforward. We have a lot of competing voices and competing demands. Um, but when we do arrive at this point where we're like, this doesn't actually make sense. And this is more about me than it is about this relationship. Then I think we do. Um, then we can make a new choice that actually feels more in alignment with the, the nervous system. And, you know, every great doctor, every great pediatrician, every great D.W. Winnicott, who was started out as a medical doctor, but became more famous as a psychiatrist. I know that's also a medical doctor, but pediatric um, psychiatrist, Michelle O'Donnell, the great obstetrician, um, Laura Gutman, who's not a doctor, but she's a PhD in psychology, they all say like, the mother is who you listen to. The mother knows. So whatever you can do to strengthen the mother's relationship to herself, and to bolster up the mother's self confidence and self trust, that's who's going to have the answer for the child. That's so beautiful. I completely agree. And I've I had as a situation I think is really cool that actually these firemen were saying the same thing. Um, I live right by the fire station and my son was like all of a sudden throwing up and he wouldn't stop. And when he was really young and I kept saying, I just feel like he's choking on something. Is it possible to choke on something, but like be able to breathe still? And I kept, I was just so confused. I hadn't had that experience. And my um, friend ran over to the fire station because she just felt like, I'll just, 
I don't know. I'll just go over there while you're dealing with this and see what we can do. And then the firemen, all they said back to her was just trust the mom. What like, listen to the mother. And I thought that was so amazing. And I, I'm sure they've just had such wild experiences, you know, but then what ended up happening was he threw up the last time he threw up, it was just like a big piece of like half of a grape or whatever. And then he stopped and it was just obviously trapped somewhere where he was having this gag reflex. Um, but he could still breathe, you know, so it didn't look like a traditional choking experience, but we were all just kind of like, whoa, I guess that's possible. And I couldn't believe that I really doubted myself, you know, but when you start to have a bunch of experiences like that, or, and so I'm assuming that's like the firemen over there, you know, they've probably seen that firsthand, a mom saying, this is what I think, this is what I think. And it, you know, turns out to be true. But yeah, I I think that's such a beautiful note to end on though. Like just ask the mother. Yeah. The mother in the little little sense and the mother in the in the big sense. And our earth and you know, like when people are wondering, "Oh, I, I wonder why all these um all these whales are washing up on shore." You know, it's like, well, because we're poisoning the water and the earth is trying to tell us something, you know, it's just, it's the answer I feel like is, is there. It's just, um, like paying attention to it. Hmm. And I just want to say one more thing before we close, cause you're right. That is a beautiful, a beautiful way to conclude is like the reason that I wrote this book, the call of the wild is because there's really not very many books out there that center the female experience within the trauma conversation. So anytime you read The Body Keeps the Score or Waking the Tiger, which are books that I really love and and scholars who have influenced me both personally and professionally, the woman is always the identified patient. And the author is always kind of the rescuer, savior, let me tell you how it's going. So I wrote this book because I wanted female experiences to be at the center Um, I started the book with a story about a pregnant person because that's just so unusual. And it's usually considered like, well, why would you even write about that? Because like, who's going to relate to that kind of thing? And it's really because I'm questioning authority. I'm questioning who we give authority to. Um, I'm questioning myself and who I confer authority to and why and why certain things feel safe or why certain things feel like, oh, that person would know more than me or more than this other person. And so for the people who are listening, I think it's really important to hear from people that look like you, from people who have similar experiences as you do, and to not view the female experience as something that's derivative. You know, if you go in a bookstore, there's no section on men's health. There's just women's health because it's considered separate from just health in general. You try to get studies done on female bodies. There's like 5% of medical research is done on female bodies because we're just considered like this derivative. And so in this conversation and um, in the book, that's really my intention is like, well, what would it actually be like for women to tell our own stories? And, And instead of me being like the rescuer or the person who's like saved this this other poor person who's having this hard experience. Like what if we are in the center of recreating how that looks and what that feels like? I love that. I I think I often forget about that, that there is only 5% of research that's done on women. And I never noticed that about women's health having its own section because of that. You know, I think it's important to to point those things out. And I love that you started the book with that. So thank you for your work always. I love, I love catching up with you. I love seeing your work. I love when, um, people get excited when they, I, like I mentioned when they're like, Oh my gosh, you know, Kimberly, I just, I appreciate you. I love you. And I'm so grateful for the information that you bring forward for all of us to to learn and experience. Thank you for joining us. 